go on to YouTube and type in my name, M-E-L-E-G-A, and parent class, um, usually Saturday night, Sunday, I put them up there. And if you want to go back and research and find inconsistencies, there's a lot of All right. Um, we got to split them into two parts because YouTube only lets you do like 45 minutes per or um, whatever. So anyway. Or if you're bored at work, you know, like, no. So anyway. So you have everything from Civil War. Oh, I'm so glad you came, Mary. I have a question for you. Um, there's a whole bunch of crap up there. So anyway. All right. So. Anyway, tonight we are going to cover a whole bunch of ground. Uh, so we're going to start here with the Peninsula Campaign. We're going to do a quick little um, rewind. Last week we did Shiloh. And when it was all said and done, Ulysses Grant said you could not walk two, two and a half miles without stepping on a body or a body part. It was this hellacious battle, 20,000 casualties, 30% um, casualty rate, which modern day 7 to 9 gets you relieved of command, and there were 20 more Waterloos to come. So the nation really didn't know what's going on. There's all these guys, and we talked about the alphabetized, attacking them on the door where they rolled them off a um, printing press last week, and you had to search through this phone book list to see if your family member was killed, wounded, missing, whatever. But it was out in somewhere, Tennessee, Mississippi. Like, where is that? I don't even really know. And so we're going to shift more to the prime time or the eastern theater. And the peninsula or the Seven Days Campaign is fought between the York and James Rivers in Virginia. Williamsburg, Yorktown, if you've been in those areas, this is it. This is where it all happens. We're going to have two Confederate generals. Number one is Joe Johnston, and he is going to be relieved slash wounded, and General Robert E. Lee is going to take over. 90,000 troops at the start. And come on in, guys. Don't worry, we're just rolling. Um, he's going to lose 15,000, and he's going to take on what should be America's great American hero, General George McClellan, who's going to have a whopping... 175,000 U.S. soldiers, with 35,000 more in reserve, and he's going to lose 25,000 of them. Yes, sir. Did you say lose, giving bad, or casualty? Um, combination of both. Um, casualty is, you know, killed, wounded, missing. Um, there's no way the Union cannot win the war in the early spring of 1862. Like, you would almost have to try to lose it. Like, you would have to intentionally blow the game to lose it. And this is what happens. The very first battle um, was kind of a sham. I told you guys last week that, um, you know, it, it was not so much the beatdown that it's made out to be. First General Urban McDowell is this big, fat guy, um, he was very gruff. Um, guys said that he had no tact whatsoever. And part of being a military officer at the time, you had to go to parties and balls and schmooze. Well, he was that guy who would double dip. Um, you know, you know, you know oh, this is real good. He had no tact or like manners. Um, they said the only battle he ever won was with the watermelon because he literally ate an entire watermelon per night rind and all for dessert, all right? So he's going about 400 pounds. Um, on campaign, he used to wear like a Vietnamese rice paddy hat. And so you have this big fat guy, he's got his, you know, sun hat on, and you know, how do I take this guy seriously? I just, I just really can't. And he inherits this army that signed up for 90 days between the spring planting and the fall harvesting, and this is going to be fun, and I've never enjoyed anything as much as I do um, soldiering. And Elijah Hunt Rhodes, this collage right back here, the guy sitting above Lincoln, I think I might have told you about it. A student made that several years ago, love him. He's 18 years old when he enters the Army. He gets out when he's 23. Signed up on July 4th and got out on July 4th. And he thought it was a whole bunch of fun. 
And then he said, as they were pulling out of Boston, he was from Rhode Island, there was this old man with a father time beard wearing his Revolutionary War soldier um, uniform and two young altar boys. And as the train pulled out of Boston to head to Washington, the guy was like, bless him. He's like, oh, wait a minute, this is kind of eerie and it's not so much fun um, anymore. But it's going to be fun, all right? We're going to get a uniform. We get to sleep outside with our buddies, all right? It's like wearing flannel and using power tools, right? right? And grilling meat on a grill. Someone's going to give us a gun and they're going to tell us to shoot it. And the bullets are free. This is going to be great, all right? It's going to be awesome. So we're going to have this big, grand um, adventure. And they were not trained. Like, you heard the old saying, like, hay foot, straw foot. Guys didn't know they are right um, from, from left. And so marching band members, we usually go outside, and I make them march. And what you had to do in the Civil War is stay very tight shoulder to shoulder. Because the guns, the smoothbore musket, was so inaccurate, only 30% of the rounds fired actually hit something. They went up, they went down, they went right, they went left. So you've got to stay tight, and you've got to shoot a virtual wall of lead to actually hit something. So it's all these intricate maneuvers. How do we go forward? How do we turn right and then go around an obstacle and go left again? And the guys couldn't even do that. And they're marched out of Washington, and they're headed south, and traveling with them are 50 newspaper reporters, like, hey, son, where are you from? What's going on? And the entire United States Senate and half of Congress. All right, this is going to be fun. All right, woo! And they packed wagons full of ice and champagne, and they printed giant golden tickets to get into the victory ball to be held in the president's mansion in Richmond, Virginia. It was assumed that we're, we're, we're going to win. And they get down there, and the Confederate general, a guy by the name of PGT Beauregard, said, okay, my troops aren't trained much better, but they can shoot. And whether you are you know, behind the West Wall defenses in, you know, Germany in the spring of 1945, or you're behind a big rock and a clump of trees in Northern Virginia in 1861, it's much easier to defend with green troops than it is to attack. You can shoot, I make you feel safe, and there's a big creek in front of you. Union Army's got to cross the creek on this tiny little narrow bridge, and then as they get across, you shoot them. All right, simple. Right. Well, Irvin McDowell says, this is what we're going to do. All right, they're across this tiny little bridge, and Beauregard's got them up in the hills in these woods. So we're going to fake like a left jab, and we're going to throw this big left hook. I'm going to go way around them and attack them from the top. And this almost works. The Confederates are breaking. They're fleeing. The Union Army is just shoving them. The one thing the guys can do is go forward. And then the unthinkable happens. There was a guy named Robert Patterson who was put up in the Shenandoah Valley, and his job was make sure no Confederate reinforcements use the railroad track to help out here. So just sit on the railroad track and literally don't move. He had 15,000 men. Just sit, or better yet, rip the railroad track up. Now nobody can use it. Well, in the Shenandoah Valley was this crazy guy named Thomas Jackson. He says, dude's sitting on the railroad track, and I've got to get down there. So he sends a few of his guys from the Shenandoah area to go into the valley, hoot, holler, scream, meow, shoot some guns, and just see if Robert Patterson is dumb enough to go in there and investigate. Right? Send a couple hundred guys. Send a few thousand guys. Just don't take all <coughs> 15,000. But the Shenandoah is scary, all right? This Jackson guy is crazy. So what I'll do is I'm going to roll deep. I'm going to take all 15,000 guys into the Shenandoah, and Thomas Jackson shoots straight by on a train. And that turns out to be the game changer. When it's all said and done, Jackson arrives just in time, and the Union Army was winning, and Jackson holds his men where he gets the nickname Stonewall, and he turns to him and says, when you attack, I want you to scream like furies. 
He orders the men to give what the rebel yell is. Something we're not really sure. It's like a yeah, like real loud, like hundreds, thousands of guys. And it's like martial arts. You yell to help your breathing and to distract somebody. So the Union Army is winning on their left. Yeah, and they do the worst possible thing that there is. They stop. Right? If I keep going, then Jackson's men can't shoot at me because he'll hit his own guys. But if it's closed with the enemy, but if I stop right here, I can now be fired upon from these guys and these guys. And that's where the Union Army loses because they simply didn't have enough training to turn, form like a V, 90 degree angle, and take on both enemies. They begin to retreat and they don't know how. And as they retreat, the senators who had crossed the bridge to watch this were corking their champagne, begin to panic. They rush down onto the bridge while reinforcements are coming across. The bridge collapses, and the Union Army's trapped its every man for himself. So it was a loss, but it was just a narrow loss because the guys simply didn't know what their job was. They didn't know what um, to do. And a big rift happens. Thomas Jackson wants to go and chase the retreating army into Washington. And Jefferson Davis says, no, if anything happens, all right, we can't rescue you on their side of Bull Run Creek. And whether it's divine providence, fate, luck, whatever you want to call it, a big rainstorm comes, washes out Bull Run Creek, and if Jackson had crossed, he would have been trapped over there. So Jefferson Davis makes a bad call. But PGT Beauregard blows him up in the press, and Jefferson Davis demotes him. He says, you know what? You're going to run your mouth. I'll send you out to Tennessee, and I don't have to worry about you any, anymore. Next guy up is this guy called Joe Johnston. And so now that Urban McDowell is demoted, we need a new general, General of the Army of the Potomac. And everyone asks, who should it be? If it can't be Lee, and they're like, oh, man, this guy here, George McClellan. You can't do better than McClellan. You just simply can't. Now, McClellan was a smart guy. Um, he graduates from the University of Pennsylvania at the age of 16, with a mathematical degree. He says, well, I'm pretty smart. I'd like to be an engineer, so I'll go to West Point and get, you know, an advanced degree. And he does, and he finishes second in his class. Everyone said there's no way that he's not going to be the most successful person we've ever met. Handsome guy, smart guy, and he goes to fight in the Mexican War where he serves with distinction, bravery under fire. He knows what's going on. And when he's done, he goes back and he teaches engineering at West Point, and the president selects him to go over to be an American observer during the Crimean War. Where if you were here last week and you got the old poem, he saw the light brigade. Um, and the Light Brigade are, most of them are sons of members of the House of Lords. They are the next generation of the leaders of the British Empire. And they go down into the Valley of Death and they just get blown to bits. And McClellan kind of fancied himself an American, like, aristocratic noble. Like, he was one of these English gentlemen just in the United States. When he saw them get killed, something within him breaks, because he's never the same again. He comes back, resigns his position in the Army, and becomes a railroad engineer for the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, where he meets a guy that he simply cannot stand, this lawyer that works with the railroad. And I think McClellan couldn't stand him, because he was the one guy that might have been just as smart if not even smarter than George McClellan, and his name is Abraham Lincoln. McClellan hates him, all right, just hates him with a passion. Now McClellan, when you all leave tonight, you're going to spit his name out in the rain, like, God, he's a scum sucker. Yes, he is. I don't want to bias you, but I hate it, all right. I mean, this guy literally, if you think of American greatness, there should literally be high schools, you know, universities, lecture halls, a $5 bill, whatever, with George McClellan on it. He had greatness set before him not once, but twice. All he had to do was reach out and grasp it, and he chokes 
every single time. I mean, literally, you would have to try to lose, and he does. But, who's an engineer out in the audience here? I know we've probably got some. All right, okay, all right, all right. Ken, what's your desk like? At work. I am, do not have a, I'm not a clean desk engineer. But you know where everything is, right? All right, who's, who, who's a clean desk engineer? All right, you are everything. All right, you got the little name plate stapler, hole punch. All right, all right. It's got a little tag there. All right. All the tools are on the pegboard in the garage. All right. Well, that's McClellan. He is incredibly organized. The one thing he does is he builds the Army of the Potomac. He rides out and he looks like a leader. And he looks at all this rabble, and he moves him to what is today the Washington Mall and says, get out of here. And he calls for drill sergeants. You're not going to be led by the officers in the, the, originally at Bull Run were the town mayor, the town pastor, and the banker or the newspaper man. For the simple fact, they were the guys in town who could actually read. Right? So your qualification is, can you read? Okay, great, you're a captain. Okay, what's my job? Well, all right, we'll figure it out. Um, he now goes against German drill instructors. All right? Going back to the Continental Army at Valley Forge, we're going to get some Manfred von Steuben up in here, and he's going to not speak English, but cuss. By the time he's done, you're going to be an army. So McClellan gets German drill instructors, and he organizes them. Group A, you're on the firing range. B, you're learning how to march, how to right wheel, how to left wheel, how to advance, how to retreat. Um, group C, you're in um, artillery. Group D, you're going to police on um, the field. Um, group E, you're digging latrines. Every, and then every hour I'm going to blow a whistle and you're going to rotate. And so everybody is broken down into groups and they learn their job. And he trains this massive army. Something that should have been done, if it was done at Bull Run, it's going to be a Union victory and the war um, is over. But it's going to take him a long time. And part of the problem is he's got a political agenda. He hates Lincoln. He's a Democrat. He's a powerful Democrat. And if I can win and make it take a little bit, I'll be the great American hero. Presidential election of 1864, I'll win. And I'll be everyone's hero. I get this idiot Hasey Lincoln out of office. So he schmoozes the politicians. He was famous for having what they called champagne and oyster clam bakes on the Potomac. He would invite the senators out when they were out eating and drinking. You men there, listen to me. And he would ride out and give these big time commands. And he, hey guys, did you see that? See how good the boys are? All right, okay, I'm, I'm, I got this. And Lincoln would come out. And he would ignore it, you know, all right? You know, he often calls Lincoln the original gorilla. And so, yeah, we get into the winter time, and Lincoln's like, okay, man, when are you going to start moving? When are you going to start moving? They will move when I am ready. So on a rainy night, literally a lot like this one, Lincoln goes to his house. And his big quote was, you know, if McClellan's not going to use his army, can I take it and borrow it for a while? He wants to go see the general. And his wife says, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. President, you know, George isn't home, he's out doing whatever. You can wait in the parlor. Okay, you know, get a cup of tea, and he's sitting in the parlor. McClellan comes home an hour later, and his wife says, um, hey, President Lincoln is here to see you. Doesn't say anything, takes his hat and raincoat off, hands them to his wife, tell the original gorilla that I'm tired and I'm going to bed. Marches upstairs oh and goes to bed. Now, if I'm Lincoln... You know, <laughs> Commander-in-Chief, probably doggone if McClellan isn't drinking a lot of milkshakes, all right? Are well, these chiclets on the floor? Well, no, ma'am, those would be your husband's teeth. Right. <laughs> How do you just say that? But he does, and Lincoln's really got no choice. So, um, skip over this real fast. We'll come back to it if I have time. And the game changer is going to be Thomas Jackson. No one's crazier or more weird than Thomas Jackson, but my man could fight. Grows up in north central Virginia. His dad dies, so his mom sends him off with his uncle, who's like this fire and brimstone Presbyterian guy, but he also drinks a lot. And when he gets drunk, sometimes he likes to beat up little Thomas Jackson. Um, he goes into town, and he sees these military guys in their nice uniforms. And he's like, wow, 
those guys look great. What are they? Well, they're soldiers. So at 16, he storms his congressman's office and says, hey, sir, I need a meeting. Well, son, you just can't come in. Well, yeah, I can. You're my representative. I need to go to West Point. Well, who are you? Thomas Jackson, sir. Why do you want to go? Well, I like those uniforms. My uncle's kind of an idiot, and this is what I want to do. <laughs> and he had these crazy, like, ice blue eyes. And everyone says when he got really fired up, you could almost see, like, lightning crackling. He's all fired up. And the congressman says, well, what's your education like? Oh, uh, well, I stopped going to the local school at four, but, you know, I do <laughs> learn at home. Oh, one of those guys. Huh? Well, fourth grade, son, ain't going to make it. West Point is a science and maths and engineering school, son. You can't just show up there and... Hey, I know how to read, and I know my AP. No, 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 but I can do it. And the congressman says, and he was so impassioned, he goes, you know what, kid, I'm going to take a chance on you. Signs the paper, Jackson never goes home. He goes up to New York, and he goes into West Point. And he gets there, and he's got some idiosyncrasies that are just straight up weird, all right? Hyper-religious. He was a fatalist. He would tell anybody who asked, um, you know, I am as safe in my bed at home as I am on the battlefield, right? When it's my time, it's my time, so I don't even worry about it. And he would walk around with his left hand in the air. He would keep his eyes open really wide. He would dunk them in the cold water in the morning. Blood made him sick to his stomach unless it was on the battlefield, so all of his meat was like charcoaled. Ulysses Grant had kind of the same thing, a weird thing there. Um, he didn't eat pepper because it made his left leg hurt. Right? <laughs> he didn't eat while sitting down because it, was, it would condense his organs and he might um, choke. So there's all these things. Um, um, he didn't dance. He didn't drink. He, he didn't cuss. But man, he was a fighter. But there was always something wrong with him. Something always hurt. There was something this. There was something that. And he gets in and everybody makes fun of him. This kid's dumb. And he immediately earned respect from the um, superior officers and the professors, because when it came to military drill, no one was better at it than Jackson. And he would be the kid who would stay up late in the library, literally learning and teaching himself the things that he was supposed to know to catch up with everybody else who graduated from high school. So when he's done, he fights and scratches and claws his way. He's 17th out of 59 which isn't bad when you look at how far down he um, started from. So when the war breaks out, he's working at the Virginia Military Institute as a professor of mathematics and artillery. And if you had him in math class, you're like, oh, God, not Jackson. God, no. All right. All right. Because when you would ask him a problem, like my math colleagues here in high school, I said that live on camera. All right. <laughs> And we go, well, I don't get it. Can you explain it to me? Well, I just did. And Jackson would, like, hit the rewind button. And he would repeat, re repeat verbatim what he just said. And they're like, well, yeah, I heard that, Professor Jackson, but I don't, I don't get it. Well, it's because you're not listening. No, I am. But can you give me a different example? Well, I just told you. Like, oh. But he was also the artillery professor. And when out there, he came alive. He was a new person. He was passionate. He was excited. And everybody loved him. Oh, God, I don't have time for this bit. Jackson was just a weird guy. And he did what he wanted, didn't care, didn't matter. He was going to do it. On the way to First Bull Run, I'm going to tell you this quick story. Um, he's going, and he, you know, he observed the Sabbath. Come on in, guys. He observed the Sabbath. Nothing happened on um, Sunday. And so he... Um, is going by this little African Methodist Episcopal church, and he hears songs being sang. He's like, hang on, they're scouting out terrain to go into um, battle. And he walks in, he's got his pistol belt and his sword on, and there's a preacher and little African American school children, and oh, oh, you're doing the lesson. Do you mind if I sit in, Pastor? And he's like, um, Okay, crazy white man. Okay. <laughs> yeah, whatever. So Jackson sits down and, you know, um, who knows this pastor? 
<laughs> yes, sir. Oh, it's a great story. All right, let me tell you. And he participates in the Sunday school class. Little kids are like, oh, okay. Now, after the Nat Turner Rebellion, it was forbidden that African American slaves were allowed to read and write. Well, Jackson gets up and says, Pastor, that was a pretty nice hymns. That was a great lesson. I really did enjoy that. But why don't the children have Bibles? Well, sir, you do know that ever since Nat Turner, you guys, you know, <laughs> said we can't like read and write. House Burgess is so, you know. Well, I think a kid should have Bibles. Well, you know, can't really read them, so it's really not going to matter. Well, I'm going to do something about that. They're literally in battle. Jackson, before he orders the charge, turns to his aide. He goes, Lieutenant, get yourself over here. What do you need? You know, General Jackson. That little church we were at a couple weeks ago is right over yonder hill. Why don't you take this to him? Well, sir, we're in the middle of a battle. Son, don't tell me what my job is. Take the envelope to the little pastor over the little church. You know, be gone. And if you ever go up there, it is Manassas African Methodist Episcopal Church. The pastor is the great-grandson of the pastor who was there. And you walk into the narthex and bolted into the wall is the letter that Jackson wrote. It's hysterical. <laughs> All right, it really is. Here is like $60, whatever it was. I believe the little children, called them colored, the colored children should have Bibles. If anyone has anything to say about it, send them to me, Confederate States of America, General Thomas J. Jackson. All right? Well, wait a minute. You're serving the government that said these little kids can't read. Well, I don't give a damn. I think they should read, so here you go. All right? That, that, that was Jackson. He was going to do what he was going to do, and that was it. So, he is going to be the game changer right here. Um, back to McClellan. McClellan, then we'll do a first demonstration. McClellan probably influences more of the Civil War than anybody else. May, even, I'm talking Lincoln and Lee. And many of the 625,000 deaths you can lay at George McClellan's feet. And so... We're going to look at this block of wood here. A block of wood, if you look at it, is about the size of a human torso, right? So how many shots out of every ten would hit their mark? Three. Three, all right? So you want to aim for the body here, all right? You know, chest and the stomach. So if you fired a 57 caliber, if you were Confederate, this little lead, you know, ball right here, it would go into this block of wood right there. And if you come up here and jam your finger in there, it goes up to the end of my little pinky nail. Right? It is a very low, slow velocity projectile. So what does that mean? Well, that means when this hits you, I forgot to bring in my glasses, so we're just going to roll the dice here. Pretend this is like, you know, your radius or your ulna or your tibia, or your fibia, the effect of that bullet going low and slow is like taking a hammer whoops, and whacking your bone with it. All right, one more for effect. Bam. All right, that's it. So when it hits the bone, it doesn't go all the way through. It shatters. All right, all right. And so you have your bone is now like little bits of glass in your arm. So the only thing you can do at this point is amputated, all right? And you can watch the famous Bill Malay amputation lesson on the uh, YouTube. All right? All right, so now to do this, the very best guys, all right, um, as close as we can come to smoothbore muzzle loader here in modern day Chapel Hill High School. You have your little tube, all right? You have your little powder horn. You count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. You put a little piece of cloth over it called patch or wadding. Then you put your um, musket ball on top of it, pull your ramrod out, and you ram that thing down in there, bang, 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 bang. Pull it back out, stick it back through, load and fire. Right, now that would take, best guys could do three, maybe four of those per minute. Right? And you're looking at an effective range, you know, 40 to 60 yards. So you're literally looking into the eyes of the guys you are fighting. So theoretically, 
the general with the most soldiers is going to win. This is all about numbers. Now the Union is going to have a little thing known as a mini ball. Right? A French guy named Alfred Manet invented it. It's more conical shaped, but has these little grooves cut into it. And inside the barrel, sort of like a spitwad pulp, he put a spiral rifling. And when the gunpowder exploded and started the projectile spinning, these grooves would, um, these circles would catch in that groove and it would come out spinning really, really, really fast. So it would go farther and it would go um, a little straighter. And the Union guys, taking an idea from the British that caused the British a whole bunch of problems in India, had their gunpowder prepackaged. They had a little tube full of gunpowder. The bullet was on top. They bit it off, dumped the gunpowder in there, squished the little metal, metal tube for their patch, put the bullet on, but they could still fire, if they were lucky, four to maybe five times a minute. So rate of fire is not all that fast. So in order to be accurate, you've got to be dis disciplined. You've got to get 40 to 60 yards away from the enemy. You've got to be able to load and fire faster than anybody else. Jackson's guys were the best at it because he trains them, he drills them, we'll pass these around, and they'll show and tell artifacts. If you guys want to whack the PVC and dowel rod later, I'll run out and get some sunglasses. All right, so anyway, not my little safety guard, but anyway, all right. So McClellan hears that Jackson is in the Shenandoah Valley, and he could follow the same pattern that Urban McDowell did going right down I-95, but he's a smart guy, he's got a better plan. Let's bypass him. What he wants to do is get guys in boats in Washington, float them down the Potomac River, sail them out into Chesapeake Bay, and land them at the York James Peninsula, where it's 60 miles from there to Richmond. Right? The Confederates don't know where I'm at in three days' time from the time we get the first boot steps off the boat and goes hard down the peninsula, we will be in Richmond. The war will be over. Great! All right, Lincoln says, great, but you got to go really fast. Speed is of, oh, yeah, we're good. Now, the new Confederate general, Joe Johnston, is still in Manassas. He's trying to shield Richmond. There's nobody to the east, and there's only this guy named Robert E. Lee, special advisor to the president, having men dig ditches around Richmond. So if we can do this fast enough, we're going to win. We're going to leave Washington. We're going to land right between the York James Rivers, zip down there three days, maybe four days' time if it rains and is a little swampy. Ding dong, the witch is dead. The war is over. George McClellan is a great American hero. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm walking on. All right. Just kind of dating ourselves. Here. So, you know, all right. So, all right. This is it. Joe Johnston stuck. Do I, do I leave? Manassas and go to Richmond? Do I go face McClellan? Do I stay here? He can't make a good choice. But problems. Lincoln says, hey, there, George, you got 210,000 men. I'm going to need a few to stay behind. Well, what do you need a few to stay behind for? Well, if you're on boats in the middle of Chesapeake Bay and Joe Johnston decides to attack Washington, what am I going to do? I need somebody to stay here and keep me safe. Well, if I move fast enough, they're not going to have enough time. George, I got it. But it's my job to see the big picture. I need 35,000 guys here to defend the government. You know, me, Supreme Court, legislative branch, I need 35,000 guys. These 35,000 guys... McClellan will always claim is the reason he lost. It could never be his fault. It's always got to be somebody else's. I'm, I'm fighting a great number of Confederates. They're coming from everywhere, man. Well, actually, you got more men on the peninsula than exists in the entire Confederate army from Atlantic to Pacific. Two times as many men as the Confederate Army will ever have. This is the biggest that we'll ever get, around 90,000. Richmond is this symbol. If we can seize it, if we can grab it, 
Like Indiana Jones 2 will tear the heart out of it, little Molaram, Sholaram, right? And it's all, it's all over, and we're done. And McClellan starts. And for the first couple days, he's doing real good, but then he's like, eh, I don't know. I said as soon as the boots hit the shore, we were going to go hard to Richmond. And he yells out to a guy named Winfield Hancock, Winfield, hold up. But why? He told me to go. No, I think we should wait till all the guys get off the boats, and then we'll all go down the peninsula together. Well, man, that'll take weeks. There's a lot of guys and a lot of boats. We don't have enough to bring all 100 that we're going to hold right here. Yeah, but let me go a little bit inland and make room. Nope, nope, nope. When they come, then you'll move forward and, oh my God. And there's no maps and it begins to rain. And so they wait and they wait and they wait and it takes three weeks. The thing is supposed to be over in three days. It's now been 21. And Joe Johnson's like, are they really going that slow? So he dispatches, you guys are going to love this, dispatches 15,000 guys under a guy named John B. Magruder, John Bankhead Magruder, who is a theater manager. He goes, General Magruder, you go down there and see if you can slow him down outside of Yorktown. And because he was like a Jedi, Winfield Hancock, you know, it's kind of like George Patton, I need you to go out two or three miles. Oh, okay. General, I think we're about two or three miles past the two or three miles we were supposed to go, oh, are we? I don't know. I don't have my cadaver. I don't know how far we've gone. I wanted to go a little bit farther just to be sure. And he's moving down the York River, and he's looking into Yorktown. And he gets called back. General Hancock, General Hancock, um, you know, General McClellan needs you. Why? Well, there's 50,000 guys in Yorktown. Have you ever been to Yorktown, right? There's like eight buildings. He's like... <laughs> No, I can see him. There's about, you know, eight, maybe 12,000, maybe 15. No, they're everywhere. Well, unless they're underground where they got really good ghillie suits, like they're right there. Like, just keep going. Like, we'll attack. No, there's hundreds of thousands of guys. No, they're not. And he's called back under threat of court martial, and Hancock is just furious. And Magruder comes up with some old props. He says, okay, where do we have guys from South Carolina, Virginia? All right, who else is seated? Okay, you know, uh, we're good. Um, Arkansas, Mississippi, last state to secede with the fewest number of slaves? North Carolina. All right, all right. we got some North Carolinians here. All right, guys, what I want you to do, I want all the officers to put on your hats and get up on horses. And there was this big hill. Right? You go down this hill, and then there was a thick set of brush in front of a small stream. And there was a little, like, you know, a little like tunnel cut through um, this brush. And the guys rode down the hill, waving the state of Virginia flag, screaming, yelling, hooping and hollering, go Virginia, UVA, you know, <laughs> tech, whatever, I don't know, all right, all right. And they get down, and they run around the hill through the brush, and then they get off their horses, and they're like, uh, UGA all the way. You can't spell sugar without UGA. Ugga, 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 go Georgia. And they run around. All right, now we're going to put different hats on, some horses, some walking. And we're from, you know, Missis uh, Mississippi. We're Old Miss. We're Eli Manning. We're this, we're that. And they literally march in a circle for eight hours. Each time playing a different state song, flying a different flag, and the clown's like, Oh my God, they got thousands of guys! And Hancock's, No, they don't. It's the same five guys. <laughs> Look, here's the gray Appaloosa again. <laughs> but he buys it. All right? He believes he's an engineer. He believes what he sees. That's it. There's so many guys, and he gets the most inaccurate intelligence of all time from a guy named Alan Pinkerton. Now, Pinkerton was an old farmer who catches some cattle rustlers in Chicago. He becomes a detective, and he starts his own detective agency guarding the railroads against all the heathen going to take over. So cops, if you see a Chinaman or an Indian, well, just shoot him. If they're Irish, take their whiskey and then 
shoot him, and that's that. So that's the Alan Pinkerton Detective Agency, and he came to Washington guarding Lincoln, and he wants a good cabinet position. Hey, President Lincoln, are you got a job for me? Well, yeah, you're you know, Secret Service. Yeah, but, you know, what's my job? Well, you like, organize the protection for the executive branch. Yeah, yeah, but what's my cabinet position? Well, kind of like right there. You stand right there, and if anybody bad comes in the door, you, like, arrest them. Yeah, 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 you know, but what's, what, what, what's my job? You're doing it. Well, no, I want a cabinet. Like, for what? Like, you're a cattle farmer, and I, like, self-made cop. So what is it that you want to do? So he's mad, he leaves, and he's cussing and screaming. Lincoln's a piece of garbage, and he goes into a pub. And who's he run into? His good old buddy, George McClellan. <laughs> right. Oh, you hate Lincoln too? Oh my God, George! Oh, Alan, what's going on? Railroad cop. All right, man. Look, why don't you come along with me? I'm going to make you head of Army Intelligence. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I do. <laughs> now, Pinkerton wants to keep his job. So he goes out and says, oh, yeah, by my estimates, it's 150, 200,000. That's many. God, I knew it. Hancock, it's the same freaking guys march in a circle. <laughs> like, literally. And so he feeds McClellan whatever he wants to hear and causes a lot of problems. Johnston's got about 70,000 guys. From the University of Pennsylvania comes a guy called Professor Lowe. He's got a fancy hot air balloon. He goes up in his little hot air balloon. He takes some pictures. Click, 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 click. He winds back down. They're on the, you know, the, the glass panes, and he puts them out. General McClellan, look, I've been flying up. And if you see the guys here, and I've counted them, and done this thing called math, all right? <laughs> He has about 70, maybe 80,000 guys. No, no, they're hitting. Well, no, actually, look, I, I took pictures of them. Come on up with me tomorrow, and I'll show you. He's got maybe 70,000 guys. No, they're hiding somewhere. The quartermaster, a guy named Montgomery Means, goes up with Professor Lowe, and he looks at the food coming in, and he, his job is to estimate how much food you need for the men, for the horses, and he says, I'm trying to feed 175,000 men. He can have maximum of eight. No, you guys are incorrect. No, we're not. McClellan refuses to believe it. And so here's Hancock going, it's 15,000 guys. I counted them. I was right behind them. Could have captured them all, but whatever. <laughs> so McClellan then changes tack. So this lightning strike, we're going to go slow but steady. The tortoise wins the race, not the hare. So he brings up these big cans called dictator cans, They're like big witch's cauldrons, and they fire a 250-pound ball at a maximum range of two miles. So he lines them up literally across the peninsula. If you've been out there, what's out there? Nothing. Nothing. They line up. The guys dig their gun pits, the big holes in the ground. They set the cannon in there. They get some cannonballs. Kaboof, 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 kaboof. And they blow them off. And they blow up dirt and rocks and trees and squirrels and rabbits and mosquitoes and frogs. But not a single doggone Confederate. So, woo, it's awesome. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they dig the guns out. They march to the edge of their blast radius. And they dig more gun pits. And they, they move up the peninsula two, two and a half miles a day. Now, when I was a teenager, late high school, the greatest, you could re-release it now and it'd still be awesome, the original Predator came out, right? And it's that scene after Jesse Ventura gets killed and Arnold and the guys are just blowing up that forest, just mowing it down. It's like, that'd be a lot of fun, right? Waste of them, they're blowing stuff up. That's all McClane blowing up trees, squirrels, rabbits, you know, mud, frogs, not a single confederate. How are they really that dumb? Yes, yes they are. So, it takes him nearly a month. Finally, he's in front of Richmond. He's six miles from downtown Richmond, from seizing victory. So close with a telescope, you could read the time on the bell tower right downtown. The war is over just another couple days. Victory is at hand. But who's in charge? George McClellan. So, McClellan says, I'm not quite ready. I need all my support. 
And Lincoln had told him, when you get to Richmond, I will send, you let me know, and I will send General Urban McDowell and 30 more 1,000 guys from the north. You come from the east, they'll come from the north, and we will destroy Richmond. But you got to let me know when they were there. Problem is, McClellan doesn't want to speak to Lincoln. He just cosmically believes, like if he thinks about it telepathically hard enough, that McDowell will know to come south. Someone's got to tell him. McClellan is in charge. And so there's a little tributary right between the York and the James called the Chickahominy River. It's not very wide, but it's really deep and has the capacity to flash flood. Because he believes McDowell is coming down I-95, because <laughs> he's just supposed to, he just yelled, you know. You know. Um, McClellan splits his forces. He takes 35,000 men and puts them on that side of the creek. They're not, they're out there, they're going to be the right wing to link up with um, McDowell's men when they come down. Now, they're in a very, very bad position if it rains and floods, which it does. So they're over there trapped. And Joe Johnston's been sweating back in Richmond. Holy crap, 175,000 guys. How the heck am I supposed to do with that? I got a bunch of young guys. I don't know what to do. And then McClellan splits his forces. <laughs> he says, I can't take 175,000, but I can take those 35. If I smash into them, maybe I will throw McClellan off kilter and we'll have a chance to get out of this. So at the beginning of um, May, June, end of May, beginning of June, there is the famous battle of Fair Oaks and Seven Pines. It accomplishes virtually nothing. It's now a golf course, and a lot of these sand bunkers are the old cannon pits from this battle, believe it um, or not. And the battles is still me, but what happens is one of those things, this guy named Robert E. Lee is behind a desk in Richmond. He is a non-factor. And Joe Johnston is kind of freaking out. And after the first day's fighting, Robert E. Lee is called to Jefferson Davis's office. General Lee, you're, you're like my military advisor. What should I do? Well, you might want to think about evacuating. You might want to get the stuff ready. I mean, they're like six miles. Well, I think, we sh I, think I should go out there and take a look. Well, Mr. President, look, I mean, there's, there's a place for you, sir. Front lines of combat just isn't it. Like, no, no I'm going to go. Lee's like, well, if you're going, I'm going to go with you. And they ride out to this place called um, Dodd's Tavern. And generals are sitting there. And inside you hear Joe Johnston yelling. And Lee and Jefferson Davis ride up. And a couple of men kind of nod. And, hey, you know, Robert, what's going on? And they walk off. And they go into the tavern. And John, you guys won't listen. You're not following my plans. I need you to go over there. And you've got to do this. And I need that to happen now. But he's kind of chaotic. And he's not clear. No one knows what's going on, and he looks at the president, and Rob, oh, what are you guys doing here, and he storms out, doesn't salute, doesn't say, excuse me, Mr. President, and Robert kind of waits, and he talks to a couple other guys, Isaac Trimble, you know, Richard Yule, guys, what's going on, oh, well, we're not really sure, Joe Johnston wants to attack, well, who does he want to attack, where, what time, with what troops, well, I'm supposed to go here, and he's going there, yeah, but guys, there's no real organization. Well, you know, you know how Joe is. We're just going to go and get him. Okay. And he goes back out. He talks to a few more fellas. And Joe Johnston had ridden away. And Lee and Jefferson Davis kind of follow him. And they get up onto this muddy road. And all these, like, privates are going through this field. And Lee's like, hold up. Who's your officer here? Well, Lieutenant Jones is down there. Well, where are you going? Well, we're supposed to go down over this hill, through that thick, and up on the other side. There's Yankees there, and General Longstreet's going to come from the other side. Well, guys, what's the terrain? Um, how many Yankees are over there? Do they have any artillery? Well, we don't know. General said, go down there and go through the woods, and we're going to give them a good what for. Yeah, but guys, what's going on? You know, what if you get stuck? What's happening? How many men are there? Ah, oh, that's what we're told. And these guys go down through this brush, and they cross the stream and get into this swamp. And all of a sudden, there's gunfire and cannon fire and screaming and yelling. And as this is happening, a wagon is coming down the road. Get clear the road! Clear the road! The generals hit. And Lee and Jefferson Davis stop it. Joe Johnston is shot in the rib cage and in the leg. He's wounded. The commanding general is out of action. Nobody knows what's going on. 
And those young Confederate soldiers come running. Oh my God, they're right behind us. Yankees are coming. Run, run, run. And Lee's like, stop here. You guys, get on the other side of the road. Lay down. Load your gun. Second group, get here. Face that way. Get on a knee. If they come running through that field, I want the first wave to shoot, then step back. Second wave, you step up. We're going to hold them right here. And uh, Union soldiers don't come. And they go back to the little tavern. And Davis is going, what's going on here? Who's in charge? Well, we don't know. Longstreet was there, and he attacked, and we were supposed to help him. But I thought he was going, and you were going. And a lot of the Confederates were killed or wounded by friendly fire. This guy's operating on their own initiative without clear orders or just, you know, I'm going to go, so I'm, I'm going to go. And they go riding back into town, and Lee writes about it in, in his diary. He had been begging for a combat command. I, I don't want to be, if I don't have to be an overall charge, just give me men to lead. It's what I do. I'm not an advisor. Jefferson, Jefferson Davis stops looking over the James River. So he was just staring at it. General Lee... What do you think? Well, well, you know, sir, I really don't know what on today. I don't want to give a, uh, you know, a good critique because I'm really not sure and I don't want to speak ill of General Johnson. I'm just not willing. You just go ahead and tell me. Well, you know, do things look organized to you? Well, sir, it's combat. General Lee, just speak plain. Nobody knew what was, what was going on. Well, sir, it was a little chaotic. General Lee, what do you think it'll take to save Richmond? Miracle, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. General Lee, I got a job for you. Yes, Mr. President, what do you need? I need you to perform that miracle. I need you to take over the army and push it back. What? Like now? Like really? There's six freaking miles and now I'm just going to wave my hands and out this double door. They're just going to disappear. Really? Now you give me a combat command? You want me to pull off this miracle? Yes, General Lee, you are now commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia. Go. And Lee's like, great. But instantly his engineer's mind, I'm kind of mad, I'm a little frustrated, but all right, what's my next job? Like, what do I have to do? How do we begin to pull this off? And he looks, and he says, first thing we need to do is to reorganize. I need more men. Or i got to press the gas pedal here a little bit. i got a great story for you guys at the end. I hope you have time. So he goes, someone get me Jackson up in the Shenandoah. Now Jackson was running around the Shenandoah, and his job was to occupy the reinforcements. And he was doing a great job. He says for Stonewall Jackson, Jackson's going to be a little late. And that's because his army marches up to the mouth of the Shenandoah, and around the town of Winchester, and he attacks the former Speaker of the House named Nathaniel Banks. This trashes him, all right? Loses more men than Banks, but scares Banks half to death. Then he disappears back into the Shenandoah, where his men know every deer path and hidden trail. They all um, grew up there. It is crazy hot in here. Am I the only one that's hot? Yeah. I, have, I have my Army of the Potomac shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> Trying not to tip it off. I'm really getting hot. So anyway, so the guys... Zip down, they go to the bottom of the Shenandoah, and they attack this um, guy named John the Pathfinder Fremont, this old, like, Jim Bridger pioneer. Trashes him so bad, he freezes for three weeks. He literally circles the wagons. Oh, God, Jackson's there. Jackson turns his men around. They go back 120 miles up the um, Shenandoah and hits Nathaniel Banks again. Word is Jackson is going to invade Richmond. Everybody's in a panic. 35,000 soldiers, 35, soldiers can't leave. When that happens, McClellan is on his own. Jackson's on the way. McClellan is hesitant. And Robert E. Lee is one of the most pugnacious, hard-fighting generals in American history. You don't need to send an invitation to him more than once. And Lee is that guy I envision like the first two Rocky movies, right? Rocky and Apollo. It's round 15, and they're just banging away at each other. And to win, you got to score points, right? In order to step in there, step into it, turn your hips, and drive an uppercut and land a knockout blow, you got to be willing to take one. You can't be afraid of getting hit. Well, for whatever reason, McClellan was. 
Lee would stand in there and take it, but not McClellan. Every time when he is on the cusp of victory, he would back off to say, while I'm living, I'm keeping the army alive to fight another day. No, one more minute, one more punch, and you win the fight. The war is over, but you got to stand in there and say, ah, I'm just going to back up. I'm, I'm going to wait. Lee's just going to keep going. So Lee jumps into action right away. He begins to act aggressive to make the army look bigger than it is. Magruder, what did you do when you had the guys march in a circle? Do some more of that. Shoot your guns, yell, demonstrate, all right? Make him think we're coming. I want him looking here, and I'm going to hit him from around the side. But we got to get Jackson here. Now, to find out where George McClellan is, Lee calls on his little favorite, little, you know, like his little, you know, nephew. Jeb Stewart, Jeb, why don't you go riding and find out how big McClellan is? And Jeb Stewart goes on one of the great cavalry rides, a little arrogant and cocky for my taste, but he rides over a hundred miles around the entire Union Army. He captures 10,000 prisoners, and he gets to the end of the peninsula, and he goes to the telegraph office in the town of Glendale on the James River, and says, Dear General McClellan, tomorrow at noon, I will be in White Oak Swamp. I challenge you to a duel to settle the war. I will be there tomorrow at noon. Tomorrow at noon, Jeb Stewart's in White Oak Swamp. All right, I'll send another little telegram tomorrow. I will be at Savage Station at high noon. Next day, he's there at high noon, and there's no George McClellan. So the southern newspapers eat this up, this big, dashing, kind of like romantic hero with his big peacock feather and his musketeer hat, rides around the entire Union army. Finding out where McClellan is, Lee orders an attack. So we're going to fight six battles in seven days, all right? End of June, each time the Union army wins, except maybe one, and they retreat every single time. Confederate armies blasted to pieces. The Union army doesn't really lose a whole heck of a lot of guys, and they still retreat because McClellan sees specters of three, four hundred thousand guys. In reality, it's 70, maybe 80. Lee, the guy with absolutely no advantages whatsoever, is gambling his new country's existence, right? Fighting against a guy that's got every possible advantage any military general has ever had, unless he had the enemy's plans squarely in his hands. And if you come back next year, we'll talk about the Great Battle of Antietam, where he literally has the Robert E. Lee's plans in his hands, and still... <laughs> vanishes to lose. Uh, you're going to be there? Awesome. All right. <laughs> All right. Told you you hate me, you hate McClellan. So anyway, all right. Lee is going to, to attack that same third over the Chickahominy. And over there is a guy named Fritz John Porter. Porter's got 35,000 guys. They've been over there for a month. And they get on this hill above this place called Beaver Dam Creek. And they're like, well, man, there's nothing here. So they go to the pine forest, and they chop them down, and they get some stakes, and they stick them in the ground. And they're like, well, where one row of logs is good, let's make two. And they get a second row of logs, and they pack it with good Georgia clay. So they make three sides of an earthen fort about 18 feet high. And they bring their cannons up on top, and they're pointed down this long slope over a river in a field on the other side. If you got to come at us, you got to come out of the woods, down a field, through a stream, up a hill, into a vertical wall. Right? Kind of like an old, think of like an old Roman like breastworks. I mean, we're, we're good. Like, you're going to come. This is um, easy. Well, um, big problem is going to happen. Confederate guy goes to sneak home to see his wife and kids, and he gets captured on the way back. The battle is about to take place as he's being um, in interrogated. And this is called the Battle of Mechanicsville. Union the Confederate Army is going to attack. Lee wants Thomas Jackson to lead it. Jackson is on the way, but for some reason he's late. 
Now, Jackson saw his men not as people, but as like tools. And he would drive them unmercifully hard. But they're worn out. Top of the Shenandoah fight, run down to the bottom fight, turn around, run back up to the top and fight, and then march 